rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy rib inside which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and the labors of my hands can fulfill thy laws demands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. I draw this fleeting breath when mine eyelids close in death when I soar to worlds unknown see thee on thy judgment throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment for silent reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory. 
glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for today comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, beginning with verse 7. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel, so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Therefore, son of man, say to your people, if someone who is righteous disobeys, that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. And if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. The righteous person who sins will not be allowed to live even though they were formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, None of the righteous things that that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil that they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but then they turn away from their sin and do what is just and right. If they give back what they took and pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right they will surely live. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just, but it is their way that is not just. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, they will die for it. And if a wicked person turns away from their wickedness and does what is just and right, they will live by doing so. Yet you Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just, but I will judge each of you according to your own ways. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for today comes from Psalm chapter 85. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God, our Savior. Put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. 
Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Our second lesson comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you would think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years now, I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth uh, comparing the Christian life and walk to running a marathon, running a race in 1 Corinthians 9. And then in the next chapter, Paul uses Israel as an example of spiritual immaturity and losing that race. Uh, we'll be talking today about the problems that Israel had and what we learned from their mistakes as we talk about temptations. Well, in our history in the 1800s, as Abraham Lincoln became a candidate for president running a political race, someone asked him, well, what are your chances? And he said, well, I don't fear Breckenridge. He is from the South and the North will not accept him. I do not fear Douglas for the South will not support him. But there is a man named Lincoln of whom I am very much afraid. If I am defeated, it will be by that man, he said. Lincoln saw himself as potentially his own worst enemy. Well, the nation of Israel, as we go back to what we're talking about in uh, 1 Corinthians, the nation of Israel was its own worst enemy according to the events that are recorded in history. 
And like Israel, God invites us to follow and to trust him. Uh, if we don't, we can, we can be our own worst enemy. History shows a people of God enjoying a very high privilege for a time. We'll talk about that, but not necessarily a final blessing. There was a reason. Paul helps us understand the Israelites of the Old Testament experienced redemption from their enemy, slavery in Egypt, and God's continuing help as he led them out of slavery in Egypt through the leader of Moses. And But they, along the way, they flirted with idolatry and uh, unbelief, and nearly all of them perished eventually in the wilderness before they reached the promised land, all except Joshua and Caleb. And we read a verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, which is the key that we want to look at today. And it says this, These things happened as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil. I'll re repeat that. These, these things happen as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil. The Israelites were examples, but they were not good examples. They were bad examples. They had paid a tremendous price for their disobedience. As I mentioned, idolatry and all that it brought with it led to their ruin. And they could not continue to sin and have it overlooked. God would not allow that. And so he continually called them back to himself, showing them uh, his signs and powerful acts that he was with them on their journey to the promised land. The miraculous crossing, for example, of the Red Sea that led them out of Egypt showed God's power and mercy toward Israel. A pillar that led them, a pillar of cloud by day and, and, by, and a fire by night guided them along their journey and uh, led them along their way. They also were provided food and drink from God, manna that God provided for them every day as they were out in the desert. And through the mouth of God's servant, Moses, their leader had been spiritually fed and strengthened, and God provided for their physical as well as their spiritual needs. All of this was done for Israel in order to deliver and save them. And yet incredibly, Paul observes in verse 5, God was not pleased with most of them, for their bodies were scattered over the desert. In, in other words, they died before they reached the promised land. They could not enter the promised land because of their disobedience and their sinfulness. Most of them is really an understatement. Of all the hosts of Israel and the spies that spied out the land to see what it was like as they were at the, right at the edge of the promised land, there were only two out of 12 that entered into that land of Canaan, Joshua and Caleb. The rest perished in the wilderness uh, from that generation. And this was uh, God's sentence against rebellion and disobedience. Uh, little sins, big sins, damning sins, really. They lusted, for example. They committed idolatry. They committed adultery. They grumbled. They complained over and over again. They kept looking back at Egypt, longing for the good old days of slavery. You can imagine that which included their disobedience and unbelief and distrust. What, a, what a, a, a damning list of sins, really. All of this after they had been delivered from slavery in Egypt for 400 years. You would think that they would be thankful to God and willing to obey him, but uh, they were not. They grumbled, they complained, they grew tired of manna that God provided. They demanded meat. At the historic moment of establishing the covenant at Mount Sinai, as Moses went up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God, at that moment, Israel, uh, the people were erecting a golden calf in order to worship pattern after the fertility gods. And with that, they were breaking uh, a couple of the commandments right away before they even received them. You shall have no other gods before me and you shall not commit a, a, adultery. Um, they pushed God as if to say, well, let's see how far we can go with this, how much we can get away with it. But uh, it was not to be gotten away with. God was going to look upon their continual disobedience 
and judged them accordingly. And God demonstrated, even, even, even still demonstrated his acts to help and strengthen them, but, but they did not honor him. Now we might ask the question as we see this background briefly, why all this news? So what? What does it mean for us? Well, here's what Paul says as he shares 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 6, where he says these things. These, now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. Of course, that's referring to the golden calf, and they worship the golden calf. If you want to read about that, you can read in Exodus 32 about that. He goes on to say, we should not, co we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. This incident that Paul mentions uh, happened as they worshiped Baal and engaged in sexual immorality with Moabite women, and you can read about that in Numbers chapter 25. We should not test the Lord as some of them did, he goes on to say, and were killed by snakes. Uh, they had put the Lord to the test and they complained about their food and Numbers 21 talks about the result of that where they were bitten by poisonous snakes. And he goes on to say, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. And we read about that in number 16 where it says this, that 14,700 14, died from a plague as a result of their complaining. These things happened as examples and were written down as warnings for us. Again, the seriousness that God places upon their disobedience. Well, has that example helped us? Well, as a nation, I'm not so sure <laughs> that that is the case for our nation is overloaded with people who cry out, who complain, who try to uh, satisfy and gratify uh, their desires regardless of any consequences to themselves and to others. The attitude often is if, if it feels good, go ahead and do it as long as it satisfies yourself. And so we have, as a result of that attitude, uh, we have widespread drug use and sexual promiscuity and perversion and crime and the list could go on. Really an invitation to break the commandments of God which leaves behind in its pathway a huge swath of broken lives. And as believers who trust in Jesus Christ, again, our lives are to be different. We know that is the case, all that the past, all that the history in the past and what we read concerning the people of God at that time uh, warn us but they also encourage us to bear fruit that comes from God. Otherwise, what has happened, what has been recorded for us uh, is in vain. God's judgment still comes upon sin and rebellion against his will. Uh, and we read that throughout the scriptures. And one of those uh, scriptures I wanna share with us uh, and see if this uh, direction that God gives us is very much related to what the people of Israel were doing uh, back then uh, in Moses' day, some 3,500 years ago. Ephesians 5 is where we wanna look at some of these verses. Ephesians 5 verses three to eight says this. And he's talking, of course, Paul is talking to the Christians in Ephesus. Among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be an obs any obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place. For of this you can be sure that no immoral, impure or greedy person such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, live as children of the light." End of quote. 
If you compared the, what Paul says to the Christians in Ephesus to that which was happening in the time of Moses, you could say, well, they were certainly parallel. They certainly were uh, closely related. But whether it be Israel and their history or Mo under Moses or us today, uh, or even in the days of Paul, the believers then, the temptations are there for all of us. And God wants us, of course, to be on guard and fight against those. Satan came to the Israelites and tempted them, not at their strongest points, but at their weakest points. As believers, Satan will do the same uh, to us when we are weak. Uh, just note this, that we fight a spiritual battle every day. God gives us the help that we need in those battles against temptation. Um, and in 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Paul reminds us as we look at the examples of the Israelites, he's, he says these words to us all. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Sometimes spiritual pride can get in the way and we think, well, there, I'm not... I'm, we can easily look at somebody else's uh, sin and say, well, I would never do that. But Paul reminds us, you know, we are just as susceptible to the things uh, that, as they are. The Bible says we can resist that temptation when it comes with the help of God. For he will not abandon us. He will not uh, uh, be unfaithful to his promises. And as Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said years ago, and as the Israelites experienced, we are, or may be, our own worst enemy. The, the Corinthians whom Paul addressed were confident in their own knowledge and in their own strength. But Paul warns them, if you do that, there's a danger, there's a pitfall, for only God can help you through in this uh, time of trial and testing and, and temptation. Well, after Paul's warnings, they needed to be encouraged so that they wouldn't be disheartened, uh, that they would not be afraid um, and so um, he reminds them that God has certainly a way out for us when we face any temptation. Verse 13, it's a verse you probably heard before, and it comes at the end of what Paul describes as uh, these sins that Israel had, um, had fallen into. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, here's the verse. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. A way out. God provides a way out. Paul gives strong encouragement to the Corinthians about temptation, though wrong desires and uh, temptations happen, don't feel as though you've been singled out. In, in other words, other Christians face the same thing as you do. It is common. What is common to men? No temptation has seized you except what is common to men. Expect it. It will happen. <laughs> Others have resisted temptation, and so can we. Temptation can be resisted because God is there to help us. And in that way, we can stand firm uh, and not fall. So what are some of those ways out? And we talk about God provides a way out that he will help us with. Let me, just, let me just list five of them briefly. One, that we recognize those people or those situations that will give us trouble or that we are weak in. Recognize those weaknesses. Secondly, run or flee from anything that you uh, know is wrong and sinful. Huh. Don't give in to them, run from them, flee from them, as the Bible says. Three, choose to do what is right. You know, you have a choice uh, to be willing to follow God or, or, or not to. So choose to do what is right in God's sight. Number four, of course, should go without saying, pray for God's help. And then along with that is number five, seek friends or other believers who love God and can offer help when you are tempted. Um, Ask them to pray with you. Ask them to help you be accountable. Ask them to um, pray for you. Every day we're in a spiritual battle. 
and uh, our flesh wants what the new nature doesn't want and vice versa. As believers in Christ, we have a new nature in Christ Jesus. And that is why there's such a battle that goes on. We don't lose that old nature, it still hangs around, but uh, we can stand firm and against those temptations that can come. Can you imagine taking your car to a mechanic, coming back at the end of the day to pay your bill, and he tells you, well, he said, most of the work is done. Well, I doubt that we'd be satisfied with that. Or suppose you, if you have a child, uh, you take that child to a, a doctor after a serious accident where both their arm and leg were broken, and uh, later on in the day, the doctor tells you, well, I have set the leg, but I've done nothing for the arm. Uh, you wouldn't feel very good about that as well. When we battle against temptation in our lives, it takes a commitment to battle, not halfway, not a halfway commitment, uh, not doing half the job, but following through as, as, as God encourages us. And it can be frustrating. We know that to be the case because sometimes we win, sometimes we don't. Uh, like Paul, we may feel like he expressed in Romans 7 where he said, what a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will help me through this hard struggle? And then he immediately in verse 25 of Romans 7 says, thanks, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows where his help comes from just as God has helped the people through the centuries. And uh, he will lead us through our wilderness, uh, as oftentimes we can relate the wilderness to the struggles that we have in our life. God will lead us through to the promised land. Uh, and one day we won't have any more struggles. But while we're here on this earth, we will. If Israel had been faithful to God the way that God was faithful to them, they would have faced those temptations in a, in, a, in a much greater way, helping them to overcome instead of giving up and falling away from God. He is the one, God is the one, who will not allow you to be tempted about, beyond that which you can bear, the Bible says. He is the one who provides a way out. He provides the way out. Now we may not use that way or of escape, but that's not his fault, that's our fault. You know, we need to commit ourselves to follow through. There were two disciples, as you recall, of Jesus in the inner circle. One was named Judas Iscariot and the other was named Peter. You've heard of those two disciples of Jesus. You know Judas as the betrayer. Uh, he would not use a way out, although I, I believe uh, that up to the point of Judas killing himself, hanging himself because of his uh, guilt over what he had done and betraying Jesus. I believe there was an opportunity for him to ask for forgiveness, but he did not take the way out. On the other hand, the other disciple, Peter, was also a betrayer uh, as he denied Christ, not once, not twice, but three times uh, right before Jesus went to the cross. And he experienced Peter did, he experienced uh, forgiveness for his sin as he was repentant and sorry for it and turned to God and asked for forgiveness. The result, of course, of that being that Peter, as we know, was used mightily by God to bring many, many people to Christ and still does through, of course, the writings that we have of Peter in the scriptures. And when temptations come, we need to pray, stop and pray. Our prayers can and ought to cry out to God in times of testing and temptation, uh, to ask for his help, to ask for his forgiveness. His word says, a couple of verses here, Psalm 50, verse 15. God says, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. That's from Psalm 50, verse 15. Then also from Psalm 95, 7, we are his people, the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And so God offers that care and God offers that um, deliverance to us as temptations come. Well, temptations feel wrongly. 
uh, God's law written upon our hearts when temptation comes knocking at the door, there is our conscience that says, hey, this isn't right. We sense that danger upon our hearts. God has written that law. Remember, temptation in itself is not sin. Uh, Jesus, you recall, uh, while he was on this earth, Jesus was tempted just as we are. Uh, he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness too, uh, yet did not sin. Sin occurs when we mishandle that temptation. Um, James 1, verse 13 and 14 says this, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. When does that become sin? When does temptation become sin? Well, when we allow that temptation to become action, uh, not just in our deeds or words, but also in our thoughts. For example, uh, in his ministry, Jesus describes uh, lust, for example, uh, though not acted upon in a physical way, if it becomes uh, in our thoughts, uh, that it too is sin. We sin by thoughts, words, and deed. Covetousness, pride, greed, envy, all sins of the heart, even though they may not be apparent to other people, we can, we can uh, hold them within our hearts. When we give in to temptation to entertain those thoughts, they take root and they defile us, and then they become, they become an action. Remember the prayer, of course, that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, and one of those <coughs> uh, petitions is, lead us not into temptation. Of course, Jesus does not lead us into temptation, but the prayer is to help us not to go to the places and hear the things and do the things that lead us into sin. We have a responsibility, really, ourselves to pay attention to what God is saying, to avoid temptation whenever we can, to take that way out that we talked about, whatever that may be. Um, we are easily carried away by things. Uh, as they come, and they come so quickly. And we look at the example of Jesus, and again, how did Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil, how did he overcome it? Well, Jesus overcame temptation in the wilderness as he answered the devil, it is written. He shared uh, the scriptures. He, he, he came against the temptation of the devil by the scriptures that he spoke to effectively uh, deal with them. And we're told in Matthew 4, 11, of course, the, uh, the, you can read about the temptation of Jesus by the devil in Matthew chapter 4. It says that the devil left him. He stood up with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, as we're, is described in Ephesians 6. And we too can take up the spiritual weapon, the Word of God which in our spiritual armor, and we didn't talk about that today, but as we fight the spiritual battle, we fight against not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this world. We have the weapons that are given to us. We have the defensive weapons, but we also have one offensive weapon that we have, the sword, which is the word of God. Uh, and we need that. We need to take advantage of that, of course, to be on the offensive, not just on the defensive. For without that word and its influence on our hearts and minds, we're open to anything that comes thrown at us by the devil or by our own sinful ways. Listen, as we close today, fighting temptation is no easier today than it was in Moses' day. And we see the example of the Israelites and their temptation and how poorly they did. Satan is the same today, of course, in, in uh, trying to draw us away from God. Only the names and Places have changed, temptations are here, battles will be fought, but battles can be won in the battle against sin. If the Israelites would have followed the Lord instead of continually rebelling and turning away from God, they would have entered that promised land, but they would not do so. Even though God continued to be patient with them, they turned their backs on God, leading to open rebellion and ultimately to their death in the wilderness. Well, as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, God promises that we too shall be victorious. Even though temptations come, he provides a way out. 
and he leads us as we're willing to be led. And I close with the petition of the Lord's Prayer again, as we've mentioned, and lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? Luther wrote, Martin Luther wrote these words, uh, God tempts no one. And we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief and despair and other shameful and uh, shame and vice. And although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. It is our goal. Victory in Jesus can and will happen as we give it all to him and as he leads us and as we allow him that room to do that and to uh, follow him as he provides the ways out to uh, lead, us for, <coughs> lead us away from sin and toward him. A lot being said today about temptation and uh, hopefully you've been encouraged by what God shares with us and that we can have the victory in him. Shall we join in prayer as we close? Oh Lord, we need your wisdom. We need you to help us walk away from the temptations that come, clarity to see the way out when we, Lord, are in trouble. You provide those for us. Thank you that you are faithful to us, patient with us so we can count on your help even our time of need. There may be uh, things today that came to mind as we talked about this uh, topic, Lord, and that, Lord, we need to stop at this point and to just cry out to you and ask and repent of our sin, to ask for your forgiveness and to be, Lord, uh, encouraged to walk your ways. If that be the case, Lord, thank you for speaking to us today. Help us. Lead us, turn us, Lord, toward you, and let us be willing to be led by your almighty hand. For in you is the victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in confessing our faith as we recite the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect. 